Welcome again to the Alternatives Expo. We're here at Alt Expo number six at Porkfest 2010. Uh, we try to bring you all kinds of interesting alternatives to the mainstream, uh, including alternative ways to think even about the libertarian movement. So that brings us to our next speaker, who's Dave Roscoe, and Dave's been involved in the libertarian movement for several decades now. He's been involved in the libertarian party a lot, and he's had an opportunity to observe uh, the freedom movement and, and some of the things that work and some of the things that don't work. So he's delivering a talk to us today on meta-strategic planning for freedom. So I'll let Dave come up and explain to you what that means. Here you go. Thanks, Dave. As Jack said, my talk is titled Meta-Strategic Planning for Freedom. Now, uh, I've been a libertarian for quite a while, as Jack said, and I would really like the libertarian movement to succeed. I'd like to live in a free society, as I'm sure a lot of you would. And um, I've been frustrated over the years with the lack of progress that's, that's been made. And I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about what we could do better to make our libertarian strategies work and let the libertarian movement succeed and actually get to a free society. And this talk is, uh, is a summary of, uh, of, of what I've come up with. My thoughts on what's gone wrong with strategies, how we might make them work better, uh, and possibly make them work very well. So that's what this is about. So first, uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about what is strategic planning? Okay, uh, uh, the wiki, the dictionary uh, defines it as a plan of action intended to accomplish a specific goal. That's what s strategy is, or what a strategy is. Uh, so strategic planning is the creation or improvement of a plan to achieve a specific goal. Now, tic-tac-toe is often used to illustrate strategic planning because tic-tac-toe is a very simple game. Well, it's simple relative to a lot of other games. And uh, they've actually analyzed it completely, and they know exactly how uh, all the options that can be taken in all of the possible tic-tac-toe games that can be made. And uh, one of the techniques they use to analyze games is to create a, uh, a decision tree showing what all the options are in a given game. Now, this is the decision tree for the first three moves of tic-tac-toe. As you can see right at the top there, that's an empty tic-tac-toe cross. And then we have three possibilities for the first move. Uh, now, in actuality, a real tic-tac-toe game, there are nine possibilities, because it's nine squares. But <coughs> because of rotations and reflections, uh, you know, all the corner squares are, are computationally equivalent. And the, uh, the edge squares are computationally equivalent. And so by, by taking into account reflections and rotations, you can simplify how many options you have. And so what they've done there in this diagram is shown only three initial options for X. X always makes the first move. Now the second move is always made by O, player O. And this shows, this level down here shows all of the possibilities for the player O given that, you know, X has made a particular move. So for example here, X made the center move down here, O has basically two options. You can only move into a corner square or an edge square. Okay? And so that's how uh, these analyses go. And in theory, what you can do is you can use these diagrams as a road map to figure out uh, how you can win the game. Now, uh, one of the problems, it's not exactly like a road map, map. The main difference is that with a road map, you make all the decisions about which way to turn. When you're playing a game, somebody else is making some of the decisions. So, for example, on this level, X is making the decisions. O is making the decisions on this next lower level down. So if you want to go to a particular place, you have to take into account you know, what, what the other player is going to do. Now, it's really difficult to see how this works at the top level of tic-tac-toe because you're so far from the end of the game. But what you can do to illustrate this better is to pick a time in the game a lot closer to the end. Now, this diagram here shows all the options available in the tic-tac-toe move tree, uh, but uh, right near the very end of the game, after six moves have been made, six particular moves, this is the state of the game at this point. And again, we have, well, in this case, we have three options for the player X, and for each of those options, we have various options for player O, and then after O makes his moves, then we have the options for player X again. And 
all these terminal uh, uh, squares here, or these, these game uh, lattices, show actual ends of games. Okay, now this one here, for example, is a win for the letter O, for the player O. This one here is a win for uh, player X. Well, no, this isn't. This is the win for player X, and this is how you might be able to get to it. Um, but uh, getting to it is a problem because you have to take into account that O is going to do its best to mess up your plans. So, for example, if you decide, oh, here's a winning position, I'm going to try to get to that. So if you go up here and you say, oh, I'm going to make this move. I'm going to play this square, okay, which becomes this square here. The game state will be here because you want to get to this win. But O is going to obviously uh, put its letter there and it wins the game. So this would be a bad choice because you know, if O is, is on the ball, O is going to win if you make this choice. So you look elsewhere. And you, you come up with the idea that, well, uh, I might win here. Um, I could get a draw here. And you just basically look at all of your options. You assume that the other player is going to look at all of his options and make the best move for him, and taking into account what moves you can make and what moves the other player can make, uh, you make the best choice. So it turns out that either one of these choices is best because it, it will allow player X to get to one of these two draw positions. And it doesn't really matter which one. Um, if you want to increase the chances of a win, uh, if O makes a mistake, you probably want to pick this option because if O does make a mistake, then you'd be able to get to the win down here. Okay, so that's basically how uh, strategic planning works when you're working with a diagram like this. Okay. Now let's go back up. Okay, so that's strategic planning in a nutshell. Now what is metastrategic planning? Okay, uh, metastrategic planning. Uh, a meta strategy is an overarching strategy determining which other strategies to use in a given situation. So metastrategic planning is the creation or selection of strategies to use in different situations. Okay, and that sounds like a simple idea, and it really is. Uh, it, it, it almost basically means looking at the larger context of a given contest or game or whatever and uh, picking out the best strategy for it. Uh, you can th a, a strategy can be a sub-strategy in a larger strategy. So uh, that's basically what metastrategic planning is. So now let's go back. Now I'm going to show you some diagrams that I've created. Uh, what I wanted to do was use the idea that they use in game theory like tic-tac-toe for diagrams that would help us think about libertarian strategy. So uh, now the differences between the two games are tic-tac-toe has two players, but our struggle for freedom has millions of players. Tic-tac-toe has its two players move one at a time, but in our struggle for freedom, players do things all at the same time. Tic-tac-toe actually comes to an end. It ends after nine moves. Um, but uh, in the struggle for freedom, you can't do that because Things can happen. Uh, you could be backtracking. Strategies fail. You try something else. Uh, it can go on forever, and and that's the problem. So what I did was I I, I came up with a notation that's that uses the uh, some of the notation from uh, tic tac toe game theory, but it can be applied to a, an ongoing strategy like ours. Uh, I've chosen to make each node in the diagram uh, be a, a rectangle. Okay, um, and each node represents a state of our struggle. I'll get more into that later. Text inside the rectangle describes that state. Nodes are connected by arrows, monodirectional arrows. You can call them edges. And text near the arrow describes the conditions that need to be true for us to follow that arrow to the next state. And when there's multiple errors that can be active at the same time, in the case of parallel strategies, we'll show that with a circle. Okay, because you can do more than one thing at once. You don't have to do one thing at a time like you can in tic-tac-toe. Okay? So, let me go back. All right, so now, <coughs> this is what the general libertarian strategy is. It's very simple. Two boxes, one arrow. You start with the state of society. <coughs> you want to get to a free society. How do you get there? We call it effective libertarian activism. Okay. That, that's all it is. Now, the question is, what's the effect of libertarian activism? Okay. Well, let's go back. 
and we'll look at some specific strategies that people have tried 